Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and we are going to take a look at topic 5.4 in just this one video that's going to cover three examples, an example one that's divided into a part A, part B, part C. That's all going to focus on this really powerful idea called the first derivative test. You've been doing most of the components of this test already when you went through your 5.3 lesson. We're just going to kind of formalize it a little bit more and do a one extra thing at the end and boom, that takes care of everything about 5.4. So what is this idea called the first derivative test? Well, first of all, I want to make sure that you're very clear on some vocabulary because a lot of times students get very confused about the word extrema or extrema as the being a plural for the word extreme and extreme just means all of the maximum and all of the minimum values combined. If we want to talk about the plural of only the minimum say if there's more than one minimum value we might call that minima and the plural of maximum is maxima just so that you know we use those terms. So here it is, the first derivative test in this wonderful blue box. Simply says, if you've got c, that's a critical number of your function f, remember a critical number? It's when your derivative equals zero or when it's undefined. On an open interval i that contains that c, f is going to be differentiable on that interval, except maybe at c, right, if it was a critical number defined because uh, the, the derivative didn't exist. Then f of c, the y value can be classified as following. Well, if f prime changes from a negative to a positive, then f, prime, f of c would be a maximum, a relative, I'm sorry, f of c would be a relative minimum. I'm gonna say that again. If f prime changes from negative to positive, you have a relative minimum. This, this picture right here, I think describes that better than anything. Notice at this point c right here, you have behavior, of a derivative that would be negative, a decreasing function, all of a sudden switches to increasing, that means that there is a minimum there. Likewise, in part two, if f prime changes from positive to negative, that's what we see over here in the second picture. A positive change, a positive derivative versus a negative derivative on the other side of this point is going to give you that relative maximum. And then if f prime doesn't change its sign at all, then we don't have a, mean, a minimum or a maximum. And that could happen in, say, either of these last two pictures where the, the graph kind of, you know, it's an increasing graph. It looks like it's going to maybe change behavior, but then, nope, it decides it's going to increase yet again. Note that this c is going to still be a critical number. This is where the derivative would equal zero just temporarily. Likewise, we can have a decreasing graph that's always decreasing here throughout this interval, and that derivative right there at c is going to be zero. All right, let's take a look at our examples here. So in example 1a, we're applying the first derivative test, and our function is 1 half x minus sine of x on the interval 0 to 2 pi. There's a reason why we want this very specific interval here. You'll see why in a moment. So the first thing that you're going to want to do, of course, is to start by taking the derivative. It's the first semester of Calc 1, after all, and you're going to take a lot of derivatives. So the derivative is going to be 1 half minus the derivative of sine is cosine. Now that we have that derivative out of the way, we now will take that derivative, set it equal to zero, and figure where it's undefined. Well, I might be able to do this undefined right now because I'm here to tell you that this derivative is defined everywhere. You probably aren't going to worry about the derivative being undefined unless you see an x value located in a denominator. That's one of the most common ways that a, a function's derivative may be undefined. It's not the only way, but it's typically the most common way. Now we're going to focus a little bit more on solving this equation, 1 half minus cosine of x equaling 0, which is just really saying cosine of x is a half. Hopefully you know a little bit of trigonometry here, folks, because it's going to be very handy in some of these problems that involve trig. So basically, here's an angle x. I know the cosine ratio, which is adjacent over hypotenuse, is 1 over 2. 
what is the measure of that angle? And the answer would be 60 degrees, right? Or pi over three. I know that because I know my 30, 60, 90 triangle relationships where I have the one and the radical, or the two and over here, if I needed it, it would be square root of three. And this is the 30 degree angle. Hence, this has to be the 60 degree angle, pi over three. Now, to exacerbate things a little bit, that's not the only answer. And that's what's kind of frustrating sometimes. You have to know that the mnemonic all students take calculus will tell you the quadrants in which cosine or sine are going to be positive or even tangent. I know that cosine is positive half, and that's going to happen in this quadrant, of course. That's where my pi over 3 is, but it's also going to happen in that quadrant, quadrant 4. So the reference angle for pi over 3 in quadrant number 4 happens to be 5 pi over 3. <laughs> it would be 5 pi over 3. And notice that both of those lie on this particular interval 0 to 2 pi. So what do we do with these? Well, the very next thing is we set up some type of an organized sign chart number line. Number line is what I've been using quite a bit uh, with some of the previous problems. So we're just going to maybe stick with that guy. So it would look something like this. And I know that I don't have to go beyond 0 and 2 pi, so I can put those at the ends. It's not real often that we have that situation, but we're going to go with that. And then we know that pi over 3 is somewhere here, and maybe pi, 5 pi over 3 might be somewhere right about there. Now our goal is to find out what is the sine of f prime. Again, this will look very familiar if you did a little bit of the work with topic 5.3 to figure out what intervals of increasing and decreasing that you all had. So, um, and I'm not talking sine of double prime. I'm talking about sine of f prime of x. So I want to really capture this f prime of x. I want to highlight it in, in an orange color. Uh, so right here's that f prime of x. I don't want to miss him. I want to make sure that I'm plugging things in correctly. So the very first thing I'm going to do is select a value somewhere between 0 and pi over 3. You have a lot of points to choose from. Maybe not many that are very cooperative, things that you can take the cosine of without, you know, breaking too much of a sweat. So maybe we try pi over 4. Pi over 4 or pi over 6, I think, would both be uh, very eligible candidates. So we take 1 half minus the cosine of pi over 4. Well, we have to know that the cosine of pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2. Now, from this information, hopefully you can see that the square root of 2 is a larger number than a 1. It's like 1.4. So we have a negative value on our hands here. All right, so what that means is the behavior of f is such that it's increasing, or decreasing, I should say, decreasing. So I'm going to write behavior of f. We keep this up. We find some nice test value between pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. We're very lucky that there's an easy one there to work with, pi. So if I plug pi in for my x, 1, minus the co 1 half minus the cosine of pi is what I'm looking at now. And I do know the cosine of pi is negative 1. So 1 half minus negative 1 is positive 1 and a half, which I didn't really need to write that, but at least I know that it is a positive number. So the behavior of my function would be such that it is increasing at this point. Now I saved the best interval for last, it looks like. This one's going to be pretty tricky, you guys, because you don't have a lot of very nice values between 5 pi over 3 and 2 pi. In fact, you might have to think of 5 pi over 3 as being 10 pi over 6 temporarily. 2 pi is like 12 pi over 6. So the best bet you have is 11 pi over 6. Now, I know that taking the cosine of 11 pi over 6 is enough to give people nightmares. But it's really not too tough. And the reason it's not too tough is that we should realize that 11 pi over 6 is going to have a reference angle of pi over 6. How is that? Well, look at this picture over here. Here's your unit circle. 
picture a unit circle around here. 11 pi over 6 is going to take you right about to there, right? All the way around, almost to 12 pi over 6. Well, that little angle that we see right there is just a pi over 6, actually a negative pi over 6. So if we took the cosine of pi over 6, which, boy, that sounds familiar. I think we could do that, right? Look at this picture. 30 degrees is like pi over 6, and the cosine of that is radical 3 over 2, right? And then we think about being in the fourth quadrant, where cosine is always positive, we can stick with that positive radical 3 over 2. So we have 1 half minus the square root of 3 over 2. And then because 1 minus the square root of 3 is going to be a negative number, square root of 3 is about 1.7-ish, we know that this is a negative first derivative. Therefore, decreasing behavior. And we're done with our number line. Now, this is where you stopped in topic 5.3. If you think about it, you were just going to tell me, where does this function increase? Where does this function decrease? Now, what I want is where are the relative extrema? So what that means is you tell me what happens if a function goes from a decreasing to an increasing. Well, decrease to increase might look like that, right? And that's going to be a relative minimum. So we can abbreviate here. We'll say a relative min at, and the x value is pi over 3. It's never a bad idea to add the y value. Sometimes you're safe just saying add x equal 3. A lot of times the directions will be a lot more clear and just say, hey, well, what x values? Is there a relative min or a max? It won't take but two seconds to plug pi over 3 in for this x. So we'll do that here off to the side. And we know that f of pi over 3 is 1 half times pi over 3 minus the sine of pi over 3. And that would give us pi over 6 minus. And then, boy, going back to this picture, the sine of pi over 3 is square root of 3 over 2. And yep, that is a pretty ugly y value. And I tell you what, I'm just going to kind of leave it somewhat like that. Uh, I may, the only thing I may consider doing is getting a common denominator. It's not super likely that you'll have to give me the y values, just read the directions. So we have a relative min there. Um, I would like you to tell me why we have a relative min. That's important. And your rationale would be because f prime of x changes from in a negative to a positive. That's going to be your very typical reasoning here. You don't want to say because f changes from in decreasing to increasing. That will not typically work on the AP exam. You must root your reasoning in a form of calculus, derivative. And I know that this particular problem doesn't necessarily say to justify your answer. I, I kind of did that purposely. We're going to see problems like this on assessments where I will say, be sure to justify your answer. So you can promise that that's coming. And it's certainly going to be the case on the AP exam. And then over here from increasing to decreasing, we can reason out that that is a relative max. That's going to occur at the very pretty y value or x value of 5 pi over 3. And then if we have to find its y value, which I know is a little bit of a pain, but we're going to go ahead and, and seek it out nonetheless. 5 pi over 3 plugged in will give us something quite, quite fun, I'm sure. The tricky thing about this is we're going to have to multiply 1 half times 5 pi over 3, which is 5 pi over 6. And then for the sine of 5 pi over 3, we're going to have a situation on our hands where 5 pi over 3 has a reference angle of pi over 3. So if we take that in consideration, the sine of pi over 3 is radical 3 over 2. But I want to say that we're going to be a negative because in quadrant 4, where 5 pi over 3 is located, uh, we're not dealing with a positive value for sine, only for cosine. So that's what we're going to have here, radical 3 over 2 with a negative sign. And basically what that's going to do is cause for this to become a plus here. And then if I get a common denominator of 6, I'll have a 3 root 3 all over 6. The reason that we have this max is because f prime of x does what? It changes 
from positive to negative. And that would take care of this example. Now I'm going to break apart these other examples that I'm going to do uh, here in a little bit. So you're going to see them in a moment. I'm going to use separate videos to, to discuss those. But I do want to just scroll over to the next page here where I have this, the sketch of these functions. And here is that 1 half x minus uh, x, sine of x. And lo and behold, you can see here at pi over 3, which is where that value would indeed be, we have our relative minimum. And then the relative maximum is occurring at 5 pi over 3, like we indicated. So our, our work was not without some kind of you know, merit. We, we were able to analyze this graph in a very accurate way. Now, if you're interested, um, I am uh, going to be running through problem B. It's a little different from the standpoint it doesn't have trigonometry. That does make things a little bit easier. So if you would like to take a look at this and practice this on your own before you watch the next video, uh, you could either do that, pause this, whatever you want to do, and uh, pick this up uh, in the next part of the video and see if you got this right. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.